Uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to speak on this uh, very important topic. It's, I, I agree with the other speakers. This is the, the most important topic. And it's a very serious topic. So I'm going to speak very seriously. And I, I'm sorry if you find my, my heavy tone disturbing, but uh, disturbing you is part of my objective. First, I'm going to speak about Islamophobia, what it is, what its origins are. And then I'm going to end by asking you a question. I'll, I'll ask you the question right now. I'll tell you what it is, and I'll ask you again later, which is, are you American? This is the question. Are you American? Um, as Dr. Fahmi said, Islamophobia is not unique. Islamophobia is not unique. It is the offspring of ignorance, and even more, it's the offspring of fear. Ignorance and fear, okay? We've seen this many times in the United States, in the history of this country, and in the history of other countries as well. Fear of the other, fear of change, fear of the future, fear about a lack of control is expressed through attacks on hatred of persecution of a minority. We saw that in this country in the 1919 and 1920, with what's commonly known as the Red Scare, or a fear of communists who, are also, who also generally happen to be from Eastern and Southern Europe, so they're also racially other, right? Uh, we all know about the McCarthy hearings and the McCarthy era, the intense scrutiny and suspicion of anybody who was affiliated with or accused of affiliation with communism in the 1950s. Anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism in this country and in central and, and uh, in fact, all parts of Europe in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. If you look at anti-Semitism, the different themes, the way Jews were portrayed in cartoons, it's exactly the way that Muslims are portrayed and talked about today. I mean, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia can be caulked right on top of one another, in fact. This is very interesting. Well, what generally does a community do in this country if it's facing this kind of persecution, if it's facing this kind of hatred? Well, usually you'd say, well, we have our constitutional rights that protect our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, and we use education to improve our lot by teaching other people about Islam, by teaching other people that the, the majority society that, Islam, that Muslims and Islam aren't dangerous, eventually we will improve our condition. Unfortunately, we find ourselves, and when I mean we here, I don't just mean Muslims, I mean Americans, we find ourselves at a very dangerous crossroads. Education, and believe me, I value education. I'm a professor, I spend all, time, all my time trying to educate people one way or the other. I don't know if I'm successful, but I do devote my life to that. Education is very important, but it won't work alone now. And I'll give you an example. This is an embarrassing example, but I'll just, I just want you to understand how pervasive, how deeply rooted suspicion and fear of Muslims is in the United States. I was on the airplane the other day, coming, I think I was coming from, um, I can't remember where. I was on the airplane, the plane was boarding, and this man got on with a big beard and a kufi and a robe, and I felt fear. Now, I'm Muslim. I, I, I mean, I was, I was literally, I felt like I was about to dissolve in sort of self-negation or spontaneously combust or something. I, I, I'm Muslim. I know lots of people, my friends look like this, and I'm, I'm feeling fear. Oh, he's going to blow up the airplane. I mean, if, I, if I'm Muslim, how... And, and yet I'm, all, I'm still suffering from the suspicion. I mean, how, how can you possibly educate this out of me? It's, I, don't, I don't see this as something that, that alone can solve the problem. Because of the power of the media, because of films, of TV, of these stereotypes that are pushed on us over and over and over again, Muslims are dangerous. Muslims are terrorists, right? This is absolutely... Uh, Dr. Fahmi gave you some statistics, but I was just uh, d doing my own calculations, okay? 
that's 0.0007% of American Muslims have been accused of, tried for, imprisoned for, for something even marginally related to terrorism. 0.0007%, okay? In 2010, 0.7% of the US population was incarcerated for some reason or the other. That means you're a thousand times more likely to be in prison just because you're an American adult than if you're a Muslim. And yet these stereotypes still govern our thinking about Muslims. The other serious challenge we face, and the thing that makes this crossroad that we're at as a country very dangerous, is that Islamophobia is not really about Muslims. Just like McCarthyism isn't re wasn't really about communism. Right? It's about what it means to be an American. This country was founded on the idea that the individual should not tremble in fear before the state. That a person should be able to speak with whom he wants or she wants, believe what they want, move where they want, associate with whom they want, that they should not be afraid of some powerful state above them that will restrict their actions, that will restrict their beliefs and their expressions. This was the vision of people like Thomas Jefferson, people like Alexander Hamilton, of Enlightenment thinkers in Europe in general. And they understood that in order to produce this vision and protect it, they had to guarantee those rights in a constitution. They had to guarantee the freedom of religion. They had to guarantee the freedom of speech. They had to guarantee the freedom of association. They had to guarantee your right against unreasonable search and seizure by the government. They had to guarantee your right to a free to a, a due process, to some kind of trial, to have your day in court, to be judged by a jury of your peers. They had to guarantee this. Apart against this, you have the nature and power of a state. And mark my words, this isn't just in, in this country, this is in every country, this is throughout history. The nature of a state, of a controlling institution, is that it will, it will increase its control. It will expand its power until it is stopped. This is precisely what people like Thomas Jefferson, James Madison understood. And this is why they built certain inalienable rights, permanent rights, into the Constitution they created for this country. The tool that states use to expand their control is fear. Fear is used by the power elite, by the establishment, to encroach on the rights of individuals, to convince a society, to convince the subjects of that state to give up their own rights. We need to take these rights away from you because we need to keep you safe. We can't keep you safe if we can't listen to what you're saying. We can't keep you safe if we can't arrest whoever we want. We can't keep you safe if we have to give you reasons why we're arresting these people. We can't keep you safe, safe if we have to have trials or we present our evidence and we show the way we do things. Oh, it's okay then. You don't have to do this. Just keep me safe, please. I'm so scared of the, of the Muslims, of the communists, of the Jews, of whoever it is. I'm so scared of them. I just want you to keep me safe. I don't care about my rights. This is the tactic of the state, wherever you are. And what, made this, what makes this country, what made it different in the past, and I hope will make it different in the future, is that it has a constitution that protects us against losing those rights. Now, the current argument that we see during the war on terror is that Muslims are so dangerous, radical Islam is so dangerous, that to fight terror, the government needs to encroach on our rights. We need to give those rights up. Right? So what people don't remember, don't realize though, is that if you give up your rights for one moment because of fear or because of something that scares you, you'll lose those rights forever. 
The government will use those rights, will, will use those new, the, those new powers for anything they want. For example, everybody knows about the Patriot Act, the USA Patriot Act that was passed in the uh, weeks after 9-11. Now, one of the provisions in the USA Patriot Act allows the FBI to do what's called a sneak and peek, right? That means they can go and look through your house, through your office, your computer, everything you have, photocopy things, copy your computer, et cetera, et cetera, without even telling you, right? They simply have to tell some, a judge, this case involves national security. Now, according to a study by the American Civil Liberties Union, between 2010, 2011, there were about 3,700 of these sneak and peeks uh, carried out. Guess, how, guess what percentage of them had to do with terrorism? The, the USA Patriot Act was about terrorism, right? It's about keeping us safe from these evil terrorists. What percentage of these sneak and peeks had to do with terrorism? Somebody guess, just give me a guess. One percent. One percent. But the rest were about drugs and anything. So the government says, we have this tool. We can use it for whatever we want now. Right? And the, the, the government says, no, 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 it's about terrorism. We're trying to keep you safe. You know, we go after terrorists. It doesn't matter if they're Muslim or not Muslim. We go after terrorists. That's, that's, that's our objective. OK. There's a list of, uh, there's a list of terrorist organizations that the United States government has. The State Department has a list of foreign terrorist organizations. On this list is a group called Mujahideen i Khalq, the People's Mujahideen, which is an Iranian Marxist terrorist organization, which hates, hates the Iranian government, which ironically is the same position that the US government has towards the Iranian government. So you have an odd situation where the terrorist organization agrees with the United States vis-a-vis -vis whether or not the uh, Iranian government, current regime, is any good. Now, Although this group is on the State Department terrorist list, prominent American politicians like Rudy Giuliani, like John Bolton, like uh, former Governor Ed Rendell, like uh, um, Howard Dean, speak and fundraise for this organization. They get paid. Not only do they do fundraisers for Mujahideen al Khalq, they get paid by organizations associated with Mujahideen al Khalq for these services. Are they, in, are they in prison? Are they even tried? Are they even accused? Are they even given any, any trouble about this? Has anyone heard of this? No. no, of course not. These are all good, loyal Americans. Why, why would they ever be subjected to that kind of treatment? Meanwhile, a man in Staten Island is indicted, tried, for including the Hezbollah channel in a cable package he's offering. He's not even doing anything. He's just offering a cable channel. Okay. A, a young man in Boston is convicted on seven counts, many of them material support for terrorist organization, because he simply put up on his website some Al-Qaeda videos with translations. The person, the expert witness who is testifying for the government against this young man, Tariq Mahanna, had more translated Al-Qaeda videos on his website than the man, uh, Tariq Mahanna, being accused and ultimately convicted. He'll spend the rest of his life in prison, right? You have people now people who ran a, the Holy Land Foundation ter, uh, char, charity organization in this country, in prison for 60 to 80 years. Underground, for what? Feeding, feeding orphans. Even the US government says, you didn't give a single dime to, to violent ends. You didn't give a single dime to, to, to hurt anybody. You gave money to the same zakat committees that the US government gives money to, that the UN gives money to but because you knew these were Hamas linked, you're aiding a terrorist organization. You lose your life, your family is destroyed. Meanwhile, politicians in this country are supporting 
fundraising for a terrorist organization, according to this U.S. government, an organization that's a terrorist group. Is that a government that's really applying this idea of fighting terror evenly? Or are they persecuting certain people for their political opinions, certain groups for their religious identifications, certain people because they come from a certain part of the world and dress one way or believe something? Is that American? So I come to the question, are you American? I ask myself this question. I mean, I'm asking myself the same question. Are you American? Do you really care about freedom? Do you really care about rights? Do you really value what Thomas Jefferson wrote, what James Madison wrote? Do you really, would you fight for the same things they fought for, that they were willing to be hung by the British for, that they started a revolution for? Or are you just passing through? Are you just here in America because the jobs here are good, right? You make good money, you can get an education, you get a job. You don't want any trouble, right? It's okay. I, I, don't, want any, I don't want anyone to bother me. I don't, I don't want to cause any problems. I don't want to be a, be a victim. Let an, someone else's father gets put in jail. Someone else's son gets put in jail. Someone else's father gets shot by the police in cold blood. But it's, as long as it's not me, I'm okay. I don't want trouble. Because this country was founded by people who didn't mind making trouble. It was founded by people who believed you could speak to whom you want. You could express whatever ideas you wanted. You could move where you wanted and settle where you want. You could associate with whom you wanted. And the government did not have a right to restrict these rights. If we Muslims in this country don't take up the challenge of fighting for our civil liberties and for the, the civil liberties, liberties of all Americans, we'll just be another frightened minority here, hoping that it's not us who gets picked next time. We'll be in a country that isn't special anymore, that isn't free anymore for anybody. What will that gain us? If, however, American Muslims take up the challenge of fighting for civil liberties, of defending the Constitution for all Americans, then not only will we, we be accepted in this country, we'll be looked to as leaders. Just a few months ago, a monument was unveiled on the National Mall for Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. A man from a racial group that decades earlier had been considered property, not even human beings. A, a, a monument was unveiled for this man because he led a movement that reminded the entire country of principles on which the United States was built, that all people are created equal. If American Muslims take up this challenge, if we have the courage to, if we're not just passing through, if we accept the risk of increased scrutiny, that we're going to be uh, inconvenienced, that we're going to lose things, that we might lose our liberty, that we might be humiliated, if we do these things to fight for the rights of all Americans, we will be accepted, we'll be looked to as leaders, and someday, not too far in the future, they will have a monument for an American Muslim on the National Mall as well. Thank you very much.